Hey, welcome to SI Now. It is Wednesday. It's May 24th and I'm Maggie. Great to everyone watching on Facebook Live. We see you. Hello. Thanks for being here on today's show. Kyrie's career night has the Cavs one step closer to the finals and with Ronda Rousey on hiatus. Joanna Yindrichich is the baddest fighter in the UFC. She will stop by later on. But well, let's begin with basketball game for Boston and Cleveland. Now many predicted a Cavs blowout and they're after their stunning loss in game three. The Vegas line was Cleveland by 16. Well, LeBron and company went down by that much in the first half before rallying on the back of Kyrie Irving for a 112 99 win. Jordan Schultz is here to break this all down. All right, Jordan, were you more reassured because the Cavaliers ended up winning this game or are you concerned after seeing another game with sloppy defensive rotations where the supporting cast all but disappeared and the Cavs had to rebound from a major hole? Maggie, I'm concerned. I'm really concerned. And I told you before game four, I thought Cleveland had a legitimate chance to lose that game as well. Now yeah. Boston gave up the lead. Three stop falling, but at some point, if you're Cleveland, you have to realize this. We're not a great defensive team. We're in the middle of the league. 40% of our offense comes from three, and right now we're just outscoring people. They shoot 60% almost last night. Uh, Boston shoots 43, which is fine, but that's not going to work against Golden State because Golden State is superior on both sides of the ball. So Cleveland has to figure out right now, before they get into the Golden State series in the finals, how to defend the three-point line because that's going to ultimately be their demise. Wait a minute. They're not going to shoot 70% no. from field goal range yes. against the Warriors. That's just shocking. Well, Kyrie, of course, absolutely magnificent. He is our adrenaline performer presented by Toyota. Let's go places. Kyrie scored a play playoff career high 42 points on just 22 shots. In the third quarter, he put up 19 in a absolutely dazzling five-minute stretch that gave the Cavs the lead. Jordan, when Kyrie is cooking, is he the better offensive player than anyone yeah, in the league? I, I think he's the most natural scoring player. The only guy that compares is Kevin Durant. For a long time, you would have said James Harden or, or Carmelo. You could still say James Harden, but I think Kyrie is the most dynamic one-on-one -on -one player in the league regardless because he is so, like you said, the pick and roll, the way he can shoot it, he gets to the basket. Even in game four when they lost down the stretch, he had a couple wonderful one-on-one -on -one moves. And the difference between Kyrie and some of the other really good scoring players, whether it's a point guard or a player like Durant off the ball somewhat, is that he can score in every single way. You know, you could say that Durant can, but Kyrie really can because he is posting up guys that are bigger than him, and he's still scoring on them. He's an unbelievable, wonderful offensive player. So much versatility, able to finish at the rim. Did seem to appear to tweak an ankle last night. Didn't hear anything about it after the game. Zaza was, was waiting for him. <laughs> Zaza was waiting for him. <laughs> we'll wait for that maybe for the next series for the finals. And while it looked like the Celtics, they may have pulled off another stunner. So should they be more encouraged because they had the Cavs on yeah. the ropes, or should they be upset with themselves that they couldn't steal another game? Well, there's no moral victories in the playoffs, but this to me is also, once again, Maggie, and I hate to keep going back to it, but you know I'm going to, is yeah. what are what are what are we realistically without without Isaiah Thomas? You know, we we can win games without him. And now if you were to trade him, you know, next year he's going to make 6.2 million. This year he made 6.8. One of the lowest played players in the NBA in terms of his output. If you're going to if you were to trade him, you can go out and get a Fultz or a Ball or whomever you think is the franchise point guard. And that way you can have more size. And I just think you're seeing without Isaiah Thomas, you see more ball movement. He's a great player, but there is something to be said about him being a ball stopper. Well, he also went to go see a hip specialist yeah. because he is dealing with that injury. Do you feel like that's going to inform what the Celtics do this offseason? Is he as good as gone? I, I think the more you break it down, a guy that's 5'9 is now dealing with a hip injury. He's still he's entering this prime. He's still got a lot of great basketball left. But, you know, at what point are you thinking with our best player at that size, what is he going to be able to give us long term? And I thought there's been a couple of things that have been really smart said about it. And the, the, the best part for me is this. Isaiah Thomas right now, as good as he is, if he's not going to ever be, if they don't think he's going to be as explosive or this is going to be an, a lingering injury at his size, this is a guy that really relies on that quickness, that sudden change of speed. You need that at his size more than maybe somebody bigger. So I, I'm worried about Isaiah Thomas if I'm a Boston fan. I'm also thinking this is now the time to strike. The iron's hot. Get, trade him. 
get some more value, and then draft a bigger guard. Yeah, this could be the silver lining of losing right. this series. It gives Danny Ainge a little more permission to tinker with the roster because fans will understand, hey, we need more if we are going to compete yeah. with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Let's wrap up something from the Western Conference Finals, shall we? Uh, a day after the Spurs were swept out of the playoffs, Coach Greg Popovich was neither bitter nor discouraged, actually quite the opposite. Here's what he had to say about the season. Popovich, I'm really happy for the group. There's only one happy team out of 30 at the end of the day. Everybody else is sad at some point. But if you have half a brain, you put things in perspective. For the first year without Timmy's leadership and with a lot of new players, these guys got it together to win 61 games and just got better and better as the playoffs Proceeded. So, Jordan, you said no moral victories before, but was the season ultimately a win the for the Spurs? The Spurs are always an exception, Maggie. <laughs> yeah, I, so. I, I, I think you look at what they did this year, it's, it's downright remarkable because Pau Gasol and LaMarcus Aldridge didn't really give them what they had hoped, and yet they go to the Western Conference Finals. They probably have a great shot, as good a shot as anybody, to win against Golden State before losing Kawhi Leonard. But long term, you got, you got a great contribution from Jonathan Simmons. You're seeing what he can give you on both sides of the floor. Uh, you're seeing what you hope can be DeJounte Murray, the, the point guard of the future, who's just 19 years old. Uh, and obviously, you know, Greg Popovich is to lose Tim Duncan, just the leadership, him being in the locker room, that's a massive thing. And, and they were right there until the injury. Yeah, we're not sure about Manu, so we'll see moving yeah. forward how they're going to fulfill his big shoes coming off the bench. Okay, a little front office news. Shockingly, not has to do with the Knicks, with not the with the Lakers, yeah. anything like that. It's actually with the Atlanta Hawks. Chauncey Billups, who's now broadcasting, working for ESPN, doing a great job, reportedly up for the Atlanta Hawks GM job. Is that a good fit for him? You know, you know I would say that at 40 years old, not having any front office experience, he, he's a little green. And, you know, Chauncey's one of the more respected guys. He was a player that got better as his career went on because he understood the game more. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're going to be a great GM. Now, I don't know if, if he's, if he's going to get this job or not. Uh, it seems like he's right there. If he does get the, the GM job, the biggest thing for me is just to surround yourself with people who do have a tremendous amount of experience. Because at 40 years old, not having been a coach, not having been in the D League, and certainly not having been in the front office, uh, that's, that's my biggest concern. But, I, I mean, he certainly has the basketball fortitude and acumen to eventually be very good in this role. Listen, sometimes we can, you know, clown a little bit about the Hawks, but they are a, perenni a perennial They're playoff, playoff team. team. Yeah. I mean, you could be walking into worse situations. Yeah. They have a lot of talent. They have sure. talent. Uh, the, you know, they have a... They don't have a great, they have a good fan base. They don't have, they don't do great stuff at that arena. They struggle to draw consistently. But if you bring in Chauncey Billups, you're going to get a guy who understands point guards. They will be, I think, a more attractive for age destination. That can help recruit, which certainly is a is a big plug. I just think you got to surround yourself, just like an experienced coach, Maggie, with somebody that really understands uh, how to go out and get players. Yeah, you got to know what you don't know, right. I think is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. yeah, Jordan Schultz, always appreciate Thanks, it. Maggie. Thank you. All right, if you've been watching the NFL owners meetings closely, you know that touchdown celebrations, they're back, everybody. But how lenient will the No Fun League actually be? Here is tight end Joseph Fourier on what's allowed and what's still off limits.
you can just walk me off. Don't walk me off. You can walk in on your own. You'll be <laughs> you. See you later. That was amazing. Okay, my next guest heading into his seventh season with the New York Giants. He is a Super Bowl champion who has inspired countless people worldwide after beating cancer while he was in college and living out his NFL dreams. Mark Herzlick is here. He's an ambassador for the Great Cycle Challenge USA. It benefits the Children's Cancer Research Fund. We're going to get into that. I want to hear about mm -hmm. all the miles you've logged and all the great work mm -hmm. that you are doing. But we're going to start with a little bit of news about yeah. you changing positions yeah. this year, changing numbers. Officially, you're going from 94 to 44, 94. Yep. You're working out as a tight end now. Yeah. The Giants draft a tight end in the first round, Evan Ingram. Who's going to yep. be teaching who about this position? Because <laughs> you're the veteran, yet right. he's well, the more traditional tight end. Oh, he's going to be teaching me techniques, and we're both going to be learning the playbook together. But uh, it, 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 you know, it was cool. It, uh, over the past couple of years, we've kind of been light at tight end. Um, and so during practices, I would play scout team tight end for, for our defense ah, to give them a look. Okay. Um, and, you know, we're doing pretty well and, and, and making some, some plays. And so our coaches started as, like, kind of a joke, like, hey, you know, pretty good day at tight end and it kind of progressed to man you should really learn this and give it a shot so uh that's the next step the next chapter and gonna be doing both tight end and linebacker wow that's fantastic well good for you hybrid role i yeah, mean you exactly. filled the need for the giants all throughout your career i want to get your thoughts on some things going on in the mm -hmm. nfl some off-season news nfl owners are meeting and they've decided to make a change to overtime it was 15 minutes now it's going to be 10. Mm -hmm. they're citing player safety as one of the reasons why. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, 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 uh, I think that overtime it, you know, is overtime, right? And, and usually it ends before the 15 minutes or 10 minutes anyways. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, games can get prolonged um, and um, you know, maybe it'll put more pressure to, uh, on play callers to, you know, expedite scoring um, rather than ending in ties. I mean, you know, ending in ties is tough for everybody, and that's happened too many times over the past couple of years. So, you know, we'll see how it affects um, injuries or injury prevention. But, you know, the, I guess obviously the less amount of minutes you're on the field, the, you know, the less amount of injuries you'll have. Yeah, I mean, five minutes, though, after you guys play this whole brutal game, I wonder how much right. that could actually cut down on players, player safety or improve player safety. One of our writers, Andrew Brandt, the MMQB, says if you're going to say player safety, you might as well get rid of overtime altogether. Yeah, I mean, I, but that's that's another thing. You don't want to end in a tie. So and I think overtime is necessary. And I think that's one of the things that uh, makes games really exciting uh, over these overtime games. But, uh, you know, it's not... You know, it's not like tennis where you can go and play like six extra hours. <laughs> you know, yeah. we, we, we have a definite end point. <laughs> Absolutely. That's for sure. Um, another thing making news. This was a, a little bit different. This was Giselle happened last week giving an interview. She says that she believed her husband, Tom Brady, had a concussion. Mm -hmm. It was undiagnosed. The NFL was surprised by this and just as we all were. I mean, give us the reality from a player's point of view. I mean, when it comes to hiding concussions, how pervasive is that? Well, I think it's gotten a lot better over, you know, really the past five years. Um, but uh, you know, concussion and concussion research um, is still progressing, and we're still learning more about, you know, what actually causes a concussion, but also the effects that concussions can have on players. Um, and the more we learn, the more the players are saying, you know what, I'm going to not only protect myself and help report, but also I'm going to protect my teammates. So if I see a teammate or if I, if I can you know, sense that there's something wrong or I saw a bad hit that maybe everybody else couldn't see because they weren't in the play, um, you really go up to them and like, look, man, go get checked out. You know, this is more important than anything, any score is you know, your safety and your family. Yeah, I mean, okay, but someone like Tom Brady, who's right. not fighting for a roster spot in any way, shape, or form, I mean, if he's hiding a concussion, or potentially hide. Mm -hmm. What a message does that send to the guys who are scrapping to make the 53-man roster? I mean, does it send the wrong message that if you want to keep your job, you have to stay on the field? Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, what we encourage everybody, whether you're, you're a young guy or a vet like Tom Brady, you know, not, not just a vet, but a superstar, like the guy, um, is that it's too important to, to mess around with. You know, you shouldn't be hiding concussions if you have concussions. Um, you know, I don't know anything about Tom's uh, specific incident, but um, what we want to encourage players to do is make sure that they, uh, they protect their own health and safety because there's only so much that 
um, you know, the NFL or the NFL Players Association can do on that side. Uh, a lot of it is self-reporting and, and, you know, you can get around it by just lying. Right. But, you know, if you're truthful, then it can help protect you uh, and your safety. You know, you're a guy who went undrafted. I mean, mm -hmm. you filled, like I said, filled a lot of needs on the roster, but I'm sure there are times when you haven't felt comfortable about mm -hmm. your place on the team. Have you ever thought about hiding a concussion if you had one or have you ever done it? Yeah, no, I, I um, I've had, uh, actually, I've had a concussion each of the past three years. Um, and so um, it's, it's interesting. You get like, you get a concussion. And honestly, if you're, when you're getting concussions, it's tough to really hide it initially, at least the ones I've had. Um, but sometimes what people do will say, they'll get a concussion and they'll say, I'm fine. I'm fine afterwards. And so maybe they'll come back the next week or, or you know, maybe only miss one week. Um, you know, I, uh, we have some great doctors and, and great trainers at the Giants and, 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 as tempting as it is to want to get back and play, um, you know it's a, it's about your safety, right? And and you can be at work sitting there watching film, but when you get back home to your wife and she looks at you and you say, you know what, I'm not risking this yeah. for it. Yeah, I can understand that. That's the yeah. realities. That's what we love your perspective for. Um, of course, you've played with numerous big superstars mm -hmm. in New York. Starts with Eli Manning, it goes to Victor Cruz, and yep. on down the line. Odell Beckham Jr. seems like he's just in a different stratosphere. We're hearing the news now about he's going to be the highest paid uh, athlete endorser mm -hmm. with these new Nike cleats. Is the attention around him different than some of the other iconic players that you've been on the field with? I think, I think the attention around Odell initially, you know, you 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 blow up in New York, you kind of blow up everywhere. Right. And you saw that with with Victor, especially that Super Bowl year and and, his, and the, uh, you know, his salsa dance and everything. Um, and. You kind of, it kind of took, I mean, Odell took it to another level. I mean, really, it, it's, and it, it kind of wasn't anything specific that he did, but it was just his whole vibe, his persona. Uh, I mean, he's made for the camera and the stardom, and honestly, he's, he's handled it really well as a teammate, um, and he hasn't caused distractions in the locker room, but at the same time, he's been able to take his, his image and his identity and I'm so happy he's been able to capitalize off it because, you know, he is a guy who literally, I mean, you, the, he starts hairdos, he starts dance traditions. I mean, like he starts, like that, he does that stuff, right? And so I'm, ex I'm excited for him and, and uh, being recognized, you know, with Nike and I'm sure they'll do great things with them too. He's a trendsetter. You also have a fantastic <laughs> hairdo. Uh, Brandon Jacobs, former teammate yep. of yours, happened to be in our studio earlier this month and he shared what it's like to be on the receiving end of Eli Manning's face. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with Eli Manning's face, yes. right? Okay, take a look at what Brandon Jacob uh, had his own impersonation of Eli. Describe what Eli Manning's face is. Eli Manning's face. If you have to look at his face to figure out what happened, you, you picked the wrong thing. <laughs> he won't give it to you. A touchdown? Here. Get pick. Just. <laughs> Eli Manning wins the Super Bowl. He's the MVP. Go. He does this. <laughs> Sit on the bench. That had everyone in the control room crack out. You know, I should mention Pro Bowl or Landon Collins yeah. was sitting next to him. I, I should have mentioned that Brandon Jacobs mm. was also Landon Collins was there. Do you have an Eli Manning face impression? Yeah, I think Brandon <laughs> did a pretty good job uh, of it. But you know, we, you might get like you might get like a fist pump or something. But then, you know, he's back. <laughs> he's back to him. It, it's you know, it's great. Some some people hate it. Like you're watching TV and you're like, why is he not more pissed off about that? Why is he not more excited about that? Um, I think he is both of those things, but he just keeps it in here. He's so keeps good. it in. He's so good at hiding whatever emotion is underneath uh, that mask. All right, some more things for you. You're entering your seventh season with the Giants, so obviously you've had a lot of great teammates like Eli mm -hmm. and others, but you, you've had a, a lot of teammates who have come and gone. Mm -hmm. We want to know how well you knew or know these teammates. I'm going to give you a fact. You tell right. me who the teammate is, okay? Ooh, right. the supplies. Go. So we're going to play a little game here, a little game with Mark Hurz. Like, which teammate said his favorite movie of all time is The Lion King? It's The Lion King. Um, gosh. Um, I'll give you a hint. This yeah. is a new teammate. Oh, a new teammate. Okay. Um, maybe um, Brandon Marshall? 
Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram, okay. On this one. Right. Okay, we're going to move on. Which teammate earned a tryout for the U.S. National Youth Soccer Team at 13 years old? Um, is that Odell? It is. Yeah. Okay, you got that one. Who served a six-game suspension while in college for eating chicken wings that were given to him by an agent? Oh, boy. That, I've got to guess a lineman. Is it? Damon Harrison, snack? <laughs> that would be a really good one if it was snack. No, it's Olivier Vernon. Oh, okay. We thought this was just so ridiculous. Who has the nickname Jackrabbit? Jackrabbit. Jackrabbit has the nickname Jackrabbit. That's the only name he goes by. <laughs> Janor, yeah, Janor Jenkins. Okay, got that one. Whose favorite movie is Life, starring Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence? By the way, very split in the newsroom on whether this is a good movie or a terrible movie. Um, this is a new teammate as well. Gosh, okay. Um, a new teammate as well. I'm going to... Maybe this one, maybe I'll say Brandon Marshall. You are absolutely All right. It's right. Brandon Good. Marshall. If you're looking to bond, perhaps you can do it there over the movie Life. Who is a owns a cattle company with his father? Oh boy. Um, the, uh, maybe Western Richburg? It's true. It yes. is Western Richburg. You're fantastic. Who spent part of the offseason in Thailand meeting elephants and watching Muay Thai fights? Uh, Romeo, right? Close. Justin Pugh. Oh, Justin Pugh. And final one, who studied ancient art and architecture during a three-week su summer program in Greece. Also a big fan of the artist Basquiat. Yeah, that was Romeo. You just had yeah, him. there we go. <laughs> See, I knew they were you world travelers. Your, you know your teammates very, very well. Okay, let's talk about the Great Cycle Challenge. I mean, you are a national ambassador for this mm -hmm. cause. This is obviously very close to your heart. When you meet families or children who are dealing with childhood cancer mm -hmm. so so difficult. What do you tell them about your own story and how do you give them any type of advice for this difficult time? Well, when I was diagnosed, um, I was diagnosed with bone cancer as a senior in college and um, it was very isolating. Uh, it kind of took me away from my teammates, away from my family and kind of gave me this burden that I had to carry seemingly by myself. But what people around me did was share their stories, share their successful stories and give me hope that there was uh, a future beyond cancer and then created teams around me for my treatments and, and that's really what the Great Cycle Challenge is all about is um, coming together and creating this team, this network um, to raise money but also raise awareness and, and give hope to um, children fighting cancer all across the country. Um, it's, uh, it lasts the entire month of June. People can sign up, they register for miles and then get uh, donations pledged to those miles and you ride, uh, whether stationary bike out on outside, kind of however you are, I'm gonna ride it on my Peloton bike at, at the house, um, and, and log miles, and this is a way that you can give back um, to help create more survivors. Sure. You know, I, I, I don't ever want some kid to be diagnosed with cancer and be told that their dreams are impossible. And I was, I was told at my diagnosis that I'd never be able to play football again, I'd never be able to walk without a cane, um, and you know, I had amazing doctors and, and research had come a long way where now I'm able to play again for the New York Giants, right? Going into seven years. And so I never want a child to feel like cancer defines their life. Um, and that's what we're doing uh, for the month of June is creating the funds to to really further the research and create more survivors. That's fantastic. Your story is so inspiring. When you hear the statistics, 42 kids diagnosed every day with a certain form of cancer, it just every breaks day. your heart to give money. GreatCycleChallenge.com. As you said, the whole month of June, how many miles are you planning on contributing? Oh man, I, you know, I, I hope to get 100 miles in. I'm gonna, you know, gonna cool. do it on the side with you know my coaches, or maybe you know they'll know, but they're they might not want me doing all the extra, but it's okay. Listen, we'll for this fantastic cause, it's I hope that it. they will understand that it is 100% worth it. Mark Herzlich, thank you so yeah, much. Thank also, you. really uh, loved your book. Thank you. You thank wrote you a so fantastic much. book, and I would recommend it to everybody. Thank you. Have fun cycling those 100 miles. 100 miles. It's gonna time. be a lot. Yeah. Uh, UFC strawweight champion Joanna Yadrachich is quickly becoming the face of women's MMA. With five title defenses and with Ronda Rousey's fighting career unclear, the Polish champion has stepped into the spotlight. She also stepped into our studio yesterday. Watch this.
the undefeated strawweight champion, Joanna Jadrejcic. I hope I pronounced that right. Almost good. Uh, Joanna Jadrejcic, but uh, this is what I said before I became a UFC champion. I, I said at the press conference, it was actually my first big press conference with the UFC, and I said, call me Joanna, Joanna the champion, because in a few days I will I will <laughs> become a, a UFC champion. So And still, like it was my fifth title defense last time, uh, two weeks ago in Dallas. So here I go. I keep my promise, you know, and still. <laughs> you did, and still, and you brought the belt with you, so thank you for that. What has been the hardest part of all of these title defenses and keeping this belt? Uh, it was not easy to uh, become a, a UFC fighter and UFC champion, but definitely it's more difficult to to keep on defending this belt because all eyes are on me. Uh, they have my opponents, the coaches uh, of my opponents, the camps, they have more time to prepare for the fight with me. So uh, it's pretty difficult, but I like it. I like to challenge myself every day and, uh, and I like to uh, keep on proving to all of them that there, there is only one strawway champion of the world. We just had Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson in the studio. He said he didn't think that champions got enough credit in the UFC because you can make a lot of money just by being a good talker and you can start wars with people and trash talk. You are the champion and have been for <laughs> two years. Do you agree with Demetrius that the champions aren't given enough respect? Uh, yes and yes and not. For me, it's all about the, the sport. I like the media. I like the interaction with my fans. I have pretty good relationship with all of them. Uh, uh, I like to comment the pictures or text to them when I have time, of course, just on my social media. But uh, the thing is, at the end, it's all about the, the sport. Uh, when my opponents uh, want to get into some uh, stronger face-off or some trash talk with me, I let them do this, you know, and I let them play with me. But at the end of the day, it's all about the sport. It's all about the, the fight. We know someone who does want to fight you, and that's oh, really? Rose Nama Yunus. Oh, Ooh, recently. Yeah. <laughs> you don't sound too impressed by that. Uh, you it's said okay. before. It's when, okay. before she's she... very talented. I think she's very talented. And I said a um, long time ago that, that she's very talented and one day she's going to become a UFC champion. But um, for sure, not, not this year, you know. <laughs> not if you can help it, right? Well, she came on our show recently and we asked her about you. And she had this sort of weird response that we were not expecting her to say. We're going to show it to you and then I'll ask okay. you for your response. Yeah, I think she was a little nervous and kind of like awkward in our first interaction. Uh, she went for a hug. I didn't see her at first. I extended my hand. So it's kind of that weird hug, shake thing, kind of whatever. And then I kind of, as she walked off, she was just kind of like, didn't know, like, wasn't really sure where she was at, you know, and then she kind of ran off just kind of awkwardly. And uh, I don't know, I think I smelled something funny. I don't know if maybe she farted or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she, uh, I don't know. I don't know what her deal is. Of course I would want to fight her. She's a champ, you know, and I respect her. But I don't know. That's just her game. You know, she tries to get in girls' heads and stuff, and she talked about my head, but I think she got booty problems. I got to say, Yuana, I've never heard anyone say something like that about an opponent, male, <laughs> female, in my life. What's your response to that? Uh, it's weird, you know, because I met her at the, at the lobby, and uh, actually, we, we said yeah, hello, we had a hug, but... This is in Denver? Yeah, it was in Denver, but, you know, I saw her so many times, and she said hi so many times, and after a few days after, I heard she was talking some uh, crazy things about me, so that's the thing. At the end of the day, if we're gonna meet, we're gonna meet uh, in the octagon, and I will, I will show to her who is the real champion, and... I don't mind, you know, people are getting crazy when they can get like better exposure, when they can talk to the media, uh, people go crazy. But like I said, I want to be remember, uh, remembered uh, as one of the best um, athletes uh, and female fighters from Poland. And this is what I matter about. Was this a cheap shot? Uh, it was cheap shot. She doesn't know how to deal with the media and, and uh, definitely she doesn't know uh, how strong I am, you know, so here we go. I know that you have aspirations outside of fighting down the road, you know, and we've seen other fighters go down this path. Ronda, of course, even yeah. Chris Weidman, who has been here uh, most recently, who's now doing sitcoms and movies. Yeah, Mike Bisping, uh, oh, cool. Mar uh, Max Holloway. There's so many people yeah. who have done it. Some of them, though, it seems like from the outside that it distracts them. 
from their fighting career. Yeah. They get focused on Hollywood and not on fighting. How do you avoid that? I agree with you, but uh, I'm focused on my preparations. Like my s sponsors, uh, the, the people from media, they know that when I'm in the camp, I'm just focused on, on preparations, you know. I do some media just a week before the fight because of the UFC and WME. And I do this media because we need to promote the fights as well. But I'm focused on preparations and I prefer to make less money. Uh, I prefer to have uh, smaller sponsors, less obligations. But at the end, I want to uh, defend my title. So I wish that all of the fighters, they they, they, they were focused like, like, like me. You know, I'm not the best, but uh, I know what, what's is, what is important. Uh, what's good, what, 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 what's better, you know, for me. So that, that's the thing. That's really interesting. You say you're not the best, but you think you're the most dedicated? I, I don't know. Like, there are so many dedicated uh, fighters in the, in the UFC. It, it's not easy. UFC is simply the best MMA organization in the, in the world. So we must be serious with that because uh, if you, you are not focused, if you uh, not work hard enough, you're out. And, and it's pretty difficult, but... Like I said, I'm focused on my fix, on, on training first. Even when I hit some media or when I, where if I must fly for some press conference be before the uh, before the fight, uh, I wake up in the morning and and I, I have training first. Then then I go and do my obligations. Well, it's been fantastic yeah. to talk with you, straw weight champion Joanna you so Yudrychich. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for this Wednesday edition of SI Now. Of course, we will be back tomorrow at 1030 a.m. Eastern. We wouldn't leave you hanging. But until then, you can keep up with all the latest sports news on SI.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. See you tomorrow.